Hi, we are live. Hi everyone. Welcome to the world of aviation with Bimmel Nair. I'm your host, Shrieker. Bimmel is an avionics technician at American Airlines and an avionics teacher from New York City. In this week, time, he likes to fly planes and launch airplane related to us. Just his middle name is Plane. In today's session, we will explore the vast field of aeronautics and specifically avionics. So, Bimmel, what exactly is aviation and avionics? Why is it important? Thank you, Shrikar. Hello, everyone. Um, glad to be here to talk with you guys something a little different from what you're used to. So, the question is what is avionics and what is, why is it important, right? So avionics basically deals with everything that's electrical on the airplane. None of the mechanical stuff, even though it is involved. Uh, avionics is really the um, computers, the software, and any sensors that you might hear about. Did you, anybody ever hear about autopilot? Yeah? yeah, autopilot, okay. Yeah. So what happens if the autopilot works? The pilot comes and writes up the, hey, listen, the autopilot didn't work. The avionics technician will have to go and find out what happened to the autopilot and try to fix it before the next flight in the morning or evening for the long journey ahead. So it's a very uh, uh, complicated job. You have to have a lot of background information and it's pretty interesting, but it's a very nice and fun job. It's a lot of, uh, like a lot of learning, a lot of sciences are involved. So whenever your parents are telling you that, you know, remember your sciences, math and uh, science, Keep that in mind because you're going to need to learn sciences for this kind of job. Does that, does that work? Does that answer your question? Or do you want more? Also, what is aeronautics? What is the field of aeronautics? Yeah. The field of aeronautics is basically everything that has to do with airplanes, rockets, or anything basically that flies. That's aeronautics, right? Um, it's a very, very, very large field. I mean, it, anywhere from engineering, to design, to uh, uh, computer-aided design, CAD, uh, chemistry, you name it, even medical. It's in the aviation field, it's in the aeronautics field. Yeah, so no matter what you're going for in college, let's say you're going for, um, I don't know, let's say finance as a college degree. How could uh, finance fit into an aviation or an aeronautics business? Because it is a business after all. Um, American Airlines, Air India, all of them are in the, in the field of business. It is an absolute business. Um, how about um, architecture? Uh, right now, um, the airport that I work at, uh, it's called LaGuardia Airport in New York. And the airport is going through a lot of uh, change, a lot of construction. And who do you think draws up all of those uh, diagrams for the buildings? All the engineers and architects come together, electricians come together, every trade, Basically, every society comes into uh, the airport and the aeronautics field. I say that uh, it's a city in itself because every single source, even paramedics, fire department, everything is in there. But the cool thing is, you know, it's not as boring as a regular civilian job. Well, it is a civilian job, obviously, but it's way more fun. It has to do with airplanes. And I'm kind of impartial to airplanes. So everything airplane is exciting for me. I wouldn't do anything otherwise. That's the only thing I would do. Uh, same here. Man, <laughs> I love planes. Um, okay, what motivated you to join the aviation field? You know, that's a that's kind of odd. I really don't know what motivated me. Okay, but I, I'll give you a little bit, little bit of uh, background information. In Kerala, and I'm not making this up, okay? Back when I was a little kid, I'm um, talking about maybe four or five years old, we used to see these lines in the sky. And we had no idea what those lines were. Little did I know those are airplanes and we thought they were like snakes in the sky or something. Um, listen, stop laughing at me. I'm not making this up. This is actually real. <laughs> so as we got older, um, my parents decided to come to the US and uh, they went to the airport and they bought me a model airplane, like a, a toy airplane basically. And I had that for a while. And I think that's where the obsession started. So I connected the snakes in the sky and all those patterns in the sky with that little device that's in my hand. And I'm like, oh, wait a second, that's an airplane. And um, I got a little bit of interest in it. In it. And uh, as I flew to the US years later, I was sitting in an airplane. I was super excited. You know, it was like the most amazing thing ever as you 
I don't know if you've ever been on an airplane where you take off and you look out the window, all of a sudden, you you know, since you're pretty much stationary and you think the world is tilting because everything else kind of went sideways. So I looked at them like, wow, this is the most exciting thing ever. So that was kind of interesting. Uh, but the, one of the most more interesting things that I found out was that my dad had an aviation background, which I never knew until I asked him about it, you know, much older as I showed my interest. He said he was, he was, uh, he was uh, in Kerala in India and he went to the top university in, in the capital of Kerala, Chirandram. And over there, he was given flight lessons, which I never knew about. And then he told me that he was actually trying to be recruited by the Indian Air Force to be a fighter pilot. I was like, what? You didn't tell me this? I was like, wow, no wonder I have this like aviation, like, you know, mind in, in me all the time because my dad was going to be a fighter pilot. I was like, wow, dad, you could have been a fighter pilot. That would have been awesome. Oh, no, didn't happen because his mother was very scared that he would get into um, trouble or would get, you know, would get killed in action or something because at that time, India was fighting a war with Pakistan and it was very, very tense situation. So my grandmother said, nope, you're not going. And then he became an accountant. I mean, from a fighter pilot to an accountant, I was like, dad, seriously? But, you know, I said, okay, fine. I'll do it one day. And still I'm trying to do, you know, both a little bit of piloting at the same time. So that's a little background of how I got interested in aviation. You know, it's one thing though, once the aviation bug bites you, it, it'll never leave. It just, it's constant. I, um, you know, Shrika, we talked about it a little before. I think uh, once you get interested in aviation, it kind of stays with you. And uh, one of my, you know, one of my coworkers, actually a lot of my coworkers talk about it. It's like, it's almost like a disease. It never leaves. It just stays with you the whole life, which is good because you should have an interest in it. Yeah. That's my interest. Uh, I've heard that you like to describe yourself as a doctor for planes. <laughs> so like your planes are your patients and you cure yeah. them. Can you yeah, elaborate of course. on that? Sure. When I go to work, sometimes we go, you know, like uh, you've seen it in hospitals. Somebody will go, doctor, 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 greeting each other. Sometimes we do the same thing at work. Doctor, doctor. And everybody's confused. Like, wait, wait, you guys are not doctors. Of course, we're not doctors. We're not medical doctors. We're plane doctors. So who's our patient? The airplane. So what's the difference between a doctor and what I do? Not much, really. Um, I won't go into too much of it, but an airplane does breathe. does have like a circuit, circulatory system. It has a, a neural system. It has all the systems that almost a human being does. It even talks back to you and tells you things. It can see things. It can hear things. So it is like a body that you're working on, except it's not a flesh body. It's a metal body. So that's one thing. But the other thing is, why do you go to the doctor? Because you feel sick, right? You're not feeling well. You're not working to your potential. So what does the doctor do? Doctor bangs his little hammer on your knees, takes your heartbeat, and does a whole bunch of testing to see what's going on with you, and then gives you a remedy to fix it, right? Well, that's the same thing I do at work. I go to work. I look at the airplane. The airplane tells me, wham, I'm broken. So what do I have to do? I have to read what the heck is going on with it, figure out what the body is doing, right? What is it supposed to do? What's it doing? So I'm basically diagnosing a problem or diagnosing my patient. And then once I figure that out, I have to actually go and uh, find a solution for the problem. You basically, well, I can't give the airplane medicine, but I sometimes I have to perform surgery, fix it, right? I have to maybe cut some wires and crimp new wires on and fix it that way. Or maybe the software inside is broken and I have to reload the software inside the airplane to fix that as well. So it is basically going in, a patient comes in, the airplane comes in and tells me that, that I'm not feeling well. I go in there and I say, all right, what's wrong with you? And then we slowly find out what the problem is and fix it just like a doctor would. So we're airplane doctors. Well, which yeah? type of airplanes, like model airplanes or real ones? No, these are real airplanes, real, real big ones that you fly you know, if you go to India or fly anywhere else, these are the big airplanes we're talking about. Oh. Big ones, real ones. Yeah. Okay. Do you know about all the airplane crashes and everything? I'm sorry? You know all the, about all the airplane crashes, like the famous ones? Of course. Uh, I study them all the time. That's a question, actually. Uh, sure, sure. We'll answer it. Yeah, go ahead, Sugar. Okay. Um... So, uh, you, what exactly is a day at work like for you? Like, what do you do on a daily basis? Oh, I'm so sad you asked me that today. I am really saddened. You know why? 
Why? Because I was I was on vacation for the last three weeks, and today is the first night I have to go back into. So it really hurts oh, to go back suck. to work. <laughs> yeah, but uh, uh, you know, I did say one thing. It's night, right? So if, imagine, if you will, if you're working at the airport, um, you know, it, it's a it's a rough uh, business to be in, uh, kinda, right? It's fun, but it's a lot of uh, it, it takes take some toughness to be in it. Because, you know, like in the U.S., I'm sure you heard that the U.S. Postal, postal Office, they deliver mail, whether rain, snow, heat, whatever. That's their logo, right? That's one of their mottos. But if you take the, that motto where weather doesn't affect them, add night to that scenario. So you, you're up in uh, New England. You know how cold it gets in the middle of February, March at night. It's a whole different story than daytime, right? It's about 20 degrees colder colder at nighttime. So it could be freezing outside. It could be snowing outside. It could be raindrops going sideways because it's so windy. It doesn't matter. The airplane's sitting on the ground at night. And why is it sitting on, on the ground at night? Because it takes passengers around during the day. Most of the flights are done during the day domestically. A lot of the international flights happen during the nighttime. It really varies because it is a 24 hour, seven days a week, 365 operation. So it really doesn't matter uh, what day you, you know, where you work, your shift and your schedule can change tremendously. You have to be flexible with that. So when I go in tonight, um, I will walk into the office and I'll get a list of airplanes that have or might not have anything on it. So I'll get like, I don't know, eight or nine airplanes with the partner. We always pair up with another person. And that person will, will, will work together and maybe we'll split up and go work on different problems because if they're minor problems, one person can go that way, another person can go this way. But if they're big problems, we'll work on it together, put our heads together. And sometimes literally we'll sit and draw things on a paper with a highlighter and color pens and write things on it for like an hour, maybe two hours, three hours, because what are we doing? We're diagnosing the patient. We're trying to figure out what's wrong with this guy. Well, airplane. And then once we do that, we go out to the airplane and then we, you know, bang a little hammer. Well, diagnose the airplane further and then figure out what's wrong with it. And once we figure out what's wrong with it, we have to figure out the cure and how to fix it. And then we find the parts for it or software for it. And then hopefully by morning time, by the sun, by the time the sun comes up, that airplane's like, ah, I feel good. I'm ready to fly now. And I say, okay, see you later. Does that work? Yeah. And then and the, and the good thing is, it's never a dull day because it could be the same autopilot broken tomorrow, but it could be a totally different problem. So it's never ever it boring. Change big problems. That is. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, we say that all the time, big planes, big problems. <laughs> because yeah, imagine, so... it, let me give one more, one more idea. Um, the size of a tire on a 747 or a 777, one of the bigger airplanes, right? Uh, can I tell you, it's probably bigger than a lot of you standing up. So imagine big planes, big problems. That's what we mean. Okay. Go on. Is it, true that, is it true that the, when, the, when a lightning bolt strikes the airplane, nothing will happen? No, nothing will happen inside the airplane. Uh, there are devices on the airplane that actually take the bolt of lightning and then takes it and then disperses it in back into the sky. There's like a diffuser for lightning. What are the details? Huh? What happens when the autopilot gets disabled by, by, you... ma by non-manually? Then the pilot has to take over. He has to fly the airplane. Simple. But, if he's... but during the long hour shifts, so what, mm -hmm. happens, what happens if both of them are sleeping and they put it on autopilot? Then, then, then they will get in trouble for sleeping on the airplane. They're not supposed to be sleeping while they're flying the airplane. They do have but during time. long haul flights. I've heard huh? that. The, I've heard about. I've heard about like, um, like uh, sometimes uh, during long haul flights, they're supposed they're like special cabins that they sleep in. Is it that true as well? That is absolutely true. There's like, like, oh man, it's like the best thing ever. It's like walking into the, the Harry Potter like school and then finding little like doors. That's exactly what it is. You go into the airplane, you never walk, you walk by this thing a million times, you never know it. But then you press a certain place 
and this little door opens up with a little, little staircase going up to the top of the airplane. And there's a little, little tiny beds, like bunk beds, basically, where the crew can sleep in. So those things do exist, yeah. But that's where they're supposed to sleep, not while they're flying the airplane. While they're flying the airplane, they're supposed to be paying attention to the instruments, making sure they're going the right way, making sure there's that's nothing wrong with the airplane. So that's why, so that's why during the log haul flights, there are two sets of pilots. And two sets, sometimes even three. Yep, yep, that's right. Three? Sometimes, yeah, long. extremely long flights. Remember, because uh, nowadays there's flights that are like 19, 20 hours long. So you might need a backup, yeah, backup, backup. Isn't the hmm? longest flight around from, from I'm pretty sure, Qatar to New Zealand? I think there's Qatar to New Zealand or Australia. And I, I think there was a, one more that started recently. Well, I think it was using an A350 uh, long range, I think. I forget the exact, uh, but yeah, you're right. It, that is one of the longer ones. That is one of the late, uh, newer ones. Which is, Which is the most difficult technical problem that could happen on planes? You have peace. Nah. Most difficult? Yeah. yeah. Or you the most faced, dangerous? Yeah, one of the most dangerous you have faced while fixing okay. your question. Are you talking about fl uh, while the airplane's in flight, right? No. No. You have, no. You have faced uh, on the ground. On the ground. What is the most dangerous thing that can happen? Yeah. yeah. Except for the fires. In your experience. In your okay. Experience. Um, well, I'll tell you one thing. Anything you do around the airplane is dangerous. It's very dangerous, okay? Being, working around an airplane, uh, wh when I do, um, it, it, a lot of things can happen. You can get electrocuted, which is not fun. And I've been electrocuted a few times by mistake. Uh, you can get crushed. You can have your fingers cut. Sometimes a lot of the, a lot of the people that, uh, work, that I work with, their fingers might be a little bit, might be missing on top because they got their finger caught in something and that can actually happen. I almost crushed my whole hand here on Christmas Eve, like about, I think six or seven years ago, when I got, you know the, you know the device that pushes the airplane back, the little cart that pushes the airplane back? Yes. Yeah? Okay. I, there's a little tube that connects the air, that airplane to that machine, the little vehicle. Yeah. And I, I got that. caught, yeah. And I got caught between that airplane and that machine. Hmm. And my, my hand went from this size to about this size, swelling up. And you have to be careful, of course, when you're on the ground. If they are running up the engines, you don't want to get sucked up. You'll it's very dangerous. You can get blown away. I'm pretty sure there was a strand of flight in which some like uh, ladies they threw coins into the engines, coins into the <laughs> engines for good luck. I see that you're. I see that you're an aviation fan. I can hear it. You know all these little strange stories that I know about. I hear something, huh? You like when airplanes? He was Birthday present was a literal plane, not plane. Not <laughs> no, it was my birthday cake, you dumb dumb. Well, still, <laughs> love. Okay, uh, building off of what Don and Sulk, uh, Sunkulp said, uh, yeah. so can you talk about the extent to which AI is being used in planes today? There have been some pretty recent controversies regarding this, like with right. the Boeing 737 Max, as everyone knows. What are yeah. your thoughts on it? Well, first of all, let me tell you, I worked on the MAX. It was a beautiful airplane. Um, I'm certified to fix those airplanes and check out the autopilot and everything else on that particular airplane as well. So I'm very familiar with this whole system. Unfortunately, that was a, uh, it's a long story, but there's a lot of people to be held responsible for that, especially Boeing. But uh, AI, concerning AI, um, there isn't too much AI at the moment on the airplanes because we rely on the humans uh, for a lot of the safety checks, even though statistically 95% of the airplane accidents are due to human interaction, not the airplane itself. Okay, so AI would come into play eventually in the future. And what happening, what's happening right now, there is a, a Airbus is working on an A350 where the airplane takes off, lands, taxis, does everything all on its own. And it has done the most recent testing, I think last week. I didn't do, I didn't uh, read too much about it yet, but I know it was a successful test of the advanced autopilot that's on that airplane. I don't know the whole name of the system because I didn't look into it that much, but it is fully capable of handling the flight from gate to gate, I think. So that's pretty impressive. But as far as AI is concerned, we, we're not sure if we're gonna have a completely AI 
airplane. I mean, how, it has to do with the people more than the technology. How many of you would feel comfortable flying with just a computer in charge? Right? I wouldn't. That's the, that's the big question. And that's, that's why we have pilots flying the airplane because we trust the human more than the actual machine. Even though the machine could be way more accurate and way more predictable than the, than the human could ever be, we still feel comfort in human beings. And that's why we like human beings. We like humans being in charge of things. We like humans in control of where we're going. So AI, it, it can happen as far as helping the pilot, but I think the pilot will still be there. And also in, in maintenance as well, in fixing the airplane, AI could do really well because it could predict failure rates. Um, I think uh, IBM Watson got involved with uh, one of the manufacturers and uh, started uh, predicting failure rates of components that could go on airplanes. So it, it is a uh, coming in, it is part of it, but I don't think it's gonna be as integrated as let's say uh, a car would be, you know, because a car you could pull over, but uh, an airplane, it's, you know, it's a little bit more difficult, but it is way, way more complicated than a car though. Does that make sense? Even though it's, you're not gonna use it much as a car, it, the airplane systems would be a lot more complicated, a lot more um, um, safety oriented. And if you guys don't know, let me give you another secret about cars and airplanes. A lot of the technology that went into airplanes eventually make it down to a car. So a lot of the technology that you have in the car, like GPS and everything else came from airplanes and braking and a few other things. But you know, we only have an hour, we can't talk about everything. <laughs> yeah, I have doubt. So yeah. uh, what would happen if you were to, you know, pull the reversal while, uh, while in midair? You cannot. It doesn't work anymore. The reverse is, the reversal cannot work in midair. Okay, it's, so, it's what, so uh, what if that happened? Oh, if it happened, it's a tragedy because um, those of you that don't know what a reverser is, it's basically, so, so let's say the airplane's going that way. That means the thrust is going this way, opposite way, right? Right? The engine's pushing or pulling, whatever. But reverse, a reverse, what it does is on the on the ground, you know, like when you uh, land on the airport and it makes a, an engine makes a very loud noise and it sounds very like, that's a reverser. That means the, the thrust is being reversed. So it's like a brake. Okay. So what happens if the airplane is flying and this wing is this wing has an engine this wing has an engine this one is going forward and this one is going backward that's going to make the airplane go turn immediately aggressively violently and and uh that kind of thing cannot happen so the safety device is put in place that it will not actually reverse itself in the air is this to deal with all aircraft or just yeah pretty much no, pretty much um, all aircraft because you don't want you want that safety feature because you do not want that reverse to go off and flight. Um, am I might to say that uh, all airplanes have this feature. I can't say that for sure because I don't work on all airplanes. Uh, and that's one thing that you should know that uh, even though I've been working on these airplanes for a good amount of years, almost 30, 27 years now, but uh, you're still learning something new every day. So for anybody to claim that they know everything about airplanes, they, it's not possible. There's still something you don't know. There's somebody, you know, there's something you've missed. So reverses, yeah, they're pretty much on almost all airplanes. And uh, I, I can pretty much bet that all, if not all of them, should have uh, something that will prevent the reverser from activating in flight. I was asking because in a lot of like military aircraft, they are able to turn like super quickly. Yeah. By the, I think I was wondering if they did the reversing thing. That's how no, they, they don't do. Laterally. They don't do the reversing thing. Remember, their their flight controls are exaggerated, so their flight surfaces are very much, um, very dynamic, right? They're not like little surfaces. They're very big surfaces. They move very quickly. But the, one of the major reasons why airplanes are um, fighter jets, for example, are able to turn at a very fast rate or a very close rate is something called thrust vectoring. So if you, if you imagine the jet exhaust of an airplane, of an airplane, like remember like fighter jets have these exhausts, that little fire that comes out, right? Mm -hmm. So it goes straight aft like this, right? But then if you have thrust vectoring, what you could do is, what does thrust vectoring mean to you guys? What does it sound like? Does it sound like anything you're familiar with or you can break the, break the words? No? You, okay. you said thrust it sounds vector. like uh, It sounds like, you know, uh, making a trajectory in which to turn. 
for me. Right. So so the 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 jet nozzle that's sitting like this, right, with the flame coming out. What that can do is it can go up, down, left, right. It can do a circle. So what happens is that the thrust can be vectored or changed. So what happens when you change the thrust? That changes the the way the airplane is pushed. So now if you're turning left, you can actually have the thrust going the opposite direction. So it'll turn left even more aggressively. Okay. So that's how fighter jets, the newer fighter jets are able to turn at a very, very incredible. I mean, you should see some of the um, acrobatics that the fighter jets do. They can actually float in the air. Um, you know, it's, it's amazing what they could do because of thrust vectoring. It's, it's, it changed the whole game of uh, fighter jets. Okay. Have you ever worked with tower control during your career oh. as an avionics technician? Well, the air, air traffic control is somebody you're going to get to know very affectionately because you have to talk to them on a daily basis. If you have to move an airplane, you have to talk to them. If you want to run an engine, you have to talk to them. So it is somebody you speak to constantly. And there is a lingo that you got to be familiar with. Like, you know, you cannot say, hey, I'm going to go taxi on taxiway A. Mm -mm, it doesn't work. A taxiway A will be called alpha. It's called the phonetic alphabet. So from A through Z or, or A through Z, Every single one has a different uh, um, like a designation for it. So I'll, I'll ask you one of these questions, all right? Um, it's, a, it's a trick one. Uh, let me try the first one. How about a T? What do you think a T stands for? What would, how would you say T? Tau? Tango. Tango, okay, good. How about you? What would be a, a, a name for you? Uranus? No, not Uranus. Uniform. Uniform. So you can go with you know, Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta, Echo. You know, you can go on for a Foxtrot. You can keep going for the whole A through Z. You have to know that in the aviation field. There's no way around it. Here's a trick one. The numbers are the, pretty much the same. You know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. But then when it comes to nine, you cannot say nine. Can you tell, can anybody tell me what is the designation for the number nine in phonetic alphabet and why is it? Maybe you've heard of it. For some reason, we cannot say nine. Nobody knows, okay. So the number nine in the phonetic alphabet in aviation, shipping and everything else is niner, niner. And the reason for that is the Germans because how do you say no in German? Nine. Nine sounds exactly the same. So if somebody tells you to go turn at uh, runway or go take off at runway nine and you say nine, wait, does that mean no? Or did you say, yes, I'll take off at runway nine? So to, to decrease the confusion, they say you cannot use the word nine, you have to use the word niner. So these are little things you have to pay attention to when you're talking about aviation, but everybody in the aviation field pretty much knows this and everybody in the shipping field knows this. This is common terminology once you get used to it. Okay. Excuse me. Yeah. Um, uh, I've seen a few like a uh, few like uh, accidents when the ground crew have messed up. Yeah. Is it rare for them to mess up? Is it what? Rare for the ground crew to mess up. It is rare. Remember, uh, airplane accidents in general are extremely rare. It's like a lottery. It's one of the safe, but it's one of the airplanes are still one of the safest. Airplane is one of the safest. Let me ask you a question. Um, what is the most dangerous part of flight? Does anybody know? Of, let's landing. say you're going to take okay, off and landing. landing. Take off a landing, okay. Anybody else? Okay. You want to know the truth about it? If I'm going to the airport and taking a flight to India, let's say from New York, right? The most dangerous part of that whole journey is the drive to the airport. That's how it is. So cars are more dangerous than actual planes? A lot more dangerous. It's more dangerous to cross a street walking or driving but than it's more train. But it's more huh? devastating when it happens. But it's more devastating when it happens than other things. Uh, it can be. It can be. Because even like a, like a ship accident or ship sinking or a train crash could have the same effect. But the... It, see, the thing is, like when an airplane crashes or has an incident, it's like a sensational news. It's like, oh, what happened to the airplane? Everybody's excited. You know, everybody wants to know what happened. Unless everybody... it's a small airplane. 
unless it's a small airplane. And there are incidences that, you know, I can tell you every day around the world, there are situations or, or incidences that happen where the engine failed or the airplane got hit by a bird or some but kind of, you know, something happened. But I've been holding on for some time. Um, how is it that oil leaks out? Oil. Okay. I it's supposed to be solid steel, but how can there be a little dents in the oil fuselage? Oil okay, I'll, I'll tell you that in a second, but let me finish what I was saying with the with the safety. Okay. Uh, I'll, get, I'll get back to the oil in a second. So uh, a lot of these accidents do happen. A lot of these incidents do happen. But what happens in a real world scenario is that uh, the pilots that are in charge of the airplane handle the situation very diligently and carefully that it doesn't make the news because nobody crashed. So incidences do happen, but the, you don't hear about it. There was an incident uh, a couple of, uh, maybe a year ago now, where Air India came into... New York, and uh, it was a 777, and they lost all of the electronics on the airplane. They had no display. The pilot didn't know where he was going, and it was a big deal. The airplane could have ended up in the water somewhere, but the pilots were so professional, and they handled the situation, and they landed at an alternate airport, and they were praised for their bravery and what happened, but it wasn't, did it make national news? No, it didn't, because they, were, they did what they were supposed to do and nothing really happened. So these kind of scenarios happen all the time. So oil, how do oil leak out? Well, it's an engine. Engine, oil, sometimes it leaks out because what happens to the seals eventually over time is that the seals break down, clearances change, wear happens to the engine and the engine starts eating up oil or starts leaking oil. It's natural tendency. Anything mechanical will break, okay? So but an engine is nothing but a mechanical component. Hmm? But this Singapore Airlines flight, it was uh, like uh, during the prime of its like uh, flight years, during the prime of its flight years, its wing caught fire due to a leak in the oil fuselage for some reason. And it uh, had was no that, and the, and Was the, that the A380? No, it wasn't the A380. That was gone to some pretty sure. That one, uh, that was heading from uh, Singapore to Italy, I'm pretty sure. Singapore to Italy. Well, I don't know that one. I'm not sure about that one. Uh, I have to look it up, it but uh, I said in Singapore, it made like in the headlines there. The entire was it the made. was it the oil or was it the fuel you're talking about? Oil, no oil. Fuel, no. Sure. Yeah, it's got to be fuel. I mean, oil does catch on fire, but the fuel is a way more bigger candidate to catch on fire. Yeah. Um, yeah, leaks do happen. I mean, uh, sometimes when you take off a hose or or there's a failure of a uh, a pipe or whatnot, fuel can leak out, and of course, if fuel leaks out onto a hot engine. It can catch on fire and it does happen. That's how the Concorde actually crashed as well. It was a fuel leak. Yeah. Okay, I have a doubt. Uh, so I've seen sometimes the planes jettison fuel. Yeah. So uh, uh, like related to that, for example, if uh, for example, a plane just took off and then someone has called in very sick, so they have to land again. So yeah. in that case, if they land with the full fuel tank, what's the worst that could happen? Okay, so the air, the airframe itself, the airplane airframe cannot handle the weight and a lot of the gear cannot handle the weight. So the gear could collapse. The airframe could have stresses on it where the, the airplane could bend or like cause some structure to warp a little bit. So you don't want to land with, uh, there's a, something called maximum landing weight. And uh, if you exceed that weight and you land uh, hard, you could damage the airplane. And the airplane either can be fixed or if it's severe enough, the airplane has to be scrapped. Of course, in a very big emergency where there's a fire or something imminent happening, you have no time to dump the fuel. Chances are the pilot's going to land and damage and take a chance to damage the airplane. But uh, more than likely, they're going to dump the fuel if the, if the scenario can be handled. Yeah, I've heard of so uh, what if fuel is dumped in the wrong place, like the ocean or something? Then they could, yeah, it's I've heard of of this scenarios of this. Once it was dumped in a schoolyard. <laughs> yeah, you know the the, the news awful. media makes the news media makes it seem like it's a uh, you know I, I know which one you're talking about the one in L.A. Uh, the fuel was dumped pretty low to the ground, and what happened is that instead of the fuel evaporating into the atmosphere, it made it all the way to the ground because the dumping was done pretty low. Uh, most of the time, that it is done over the that ocean, that so. Uh, so it, uh, it is done over the ocean so that it doesn't uh, harm the people. And usually by that time, most of the fuel evaporates in fact into the atmosphere, which is not the greatest thing, but it is better than coming and having an airplane crash. 
Um, is me, sir. Yeah. I have a doubt. Okay. Who's that? Jajan. Okay, go ahead. So how we, uh, how we land at night time and how pilots can see at night time? Oh, okay. That's a good question. Um, see, the pilots doesn't have to see at night. Um, there are, like, okay, we'll go to the highest possibility. Uh, there are systems on like fighter jets and military jets where they can look outside and they can actually see because they have infrared um, sensors and there's like a special camera that makes nighttime look like almost like daytime with a little green tint to it. But uh, on most commercial airplanes, we don't have that. All we have is instruments in front of us. So there's instruments that tell you if the airplane's going up, airplane's going down, left, right, how high the airplane is. And if the airplane is approaching a runway, where the runway is, it knows the location of it, it uses GPS. So the pilot has a, a cluster, a big panel full of instruments telling you where all of this is, where all the, all the land, land features are, where the airports are. So it's not like the pilot is flying blind, even though the pilot cannot see, he can see what the airplane can see. So he or she can manipulate the airplane according to that. And of course, in most scenarios, uh, good weather permitting, the autopilot will be on and autopilot can very safely make a landing at night without any problem because it doesn't need to see light outside. Okay. To just to spice things up, yeah. what do you think of the Bermuda Triangle? <laughs> the uh, Bermuda Triangle. List yeah. Of so plain mystery there. Right. So this, I'm a fan for all these uh, weird occurrences around the world and uh, scenarios or cover-ups, what they call it. So Bermuda Triangle, you know, there are places around the world where there's magnetic variations that are very strong uh, that would mess up compasses. Evans Triangle. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So there are these places around the world, Bermuda Triangle being one of the most famous ones. Okay. Now, airplanes disappearing over there could be because of the, like I said, the magnetic variation that, that occurs or the anomalies that happens because a pilot uses that compass to obviously travel over water, right? But then if you get lost and the compass tells you, hey, west is here, but it's really here, then you could get lost. So a lot of the accidents, a lot of the incidences are because of that. Now, there's another one. A lot of people don't know this, and I've seen this study on it. It's pretty interesting. Boats disappearing, right? Because airplanes and and boats have a lot of things in common, both disappearing. So what happened is that they said that there's, a, there's these uh, air pockets underneath the ocean. And as the air comes up, right? And the boat is sitting on the, on the water, the air comes up and now the displacement of the boat and the air causes, uh, well, you need water underneath the boat for, for the boat to displace, right? For that water, to, for the boat to float. But if there's air underneath, what happens to the, to the boat? The boat kind of sinks instantly and you won't see any evidence of a crash or anything because the boat just boat was just you know boating along quite fine also it encountered a very large air pocket or very large bubbles and then the boat just went bloop, under the water like you like if you're sitting in a tub of water and you just put your head under the water like you just went bloop, right under the water the boat does the same thing but it won't come up so there has been a few explanations as far as that is concerned as well but as far, as far as the airplane it's just, I think, anomalies that are happening. And uh, just by chance, I think it's just, you know, just more crashes happened around or disappearance happens around over there. And it became a mystery and it became a, like a whole huh? mysterious force that's happening over there or evil force. But it's not none of the sort. It can be explained, but we just haven't found the proper explanation yet, a full explanation yet. Sir? Yeah? Sorry for bombarding you with questions about the, like, like different types of plane crashes, but no. I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure water landings are some of the rarest ones, aren't they? Yes, water landings are extremely rare. Water ditching, as we call it, it's um, it's a process. Uh, not too many successful ones have happened, except for the U.S. Air one in the U.S. Um, I don't you know with Captain Sully, where he successfully landed the airplane in the Hudson, uh, yeah. which is actually not too far from where we are, and that was the I don't, I don't want to say the only one that I know of, but I, I'm pretty sure that's one of the most successful stories because nobody was killed in that. Pretty sure there was process. another one near Indonesia and mm -hmm. that wasn't successful. The entire airplane broke up on the shore. Yeah, it can happen. I, we all, I've also seen where a bunch of hijackers try to hijack an airplane and the airplane yeah, ran out of fuel. 
All right, I think that was somewhere in Africa, I think. I don't remember exactly where. Ethiopia. But yeah, Ethiopia. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's not something that you want to do because obviously those airplanes have the engine sitting on the bottom. And as soon as the engines hit the bottom, that has an immediate effect on how the airplane flows on the water. It'll, it's like a big dead stop immediately. Um, so there is a way to do it, but it's extremely rare. And you don't want to do it. You want to be on land. And yeah, and this and uh, this this uh, type of thing called uh, there's this plane called the Gimli glider. Do you know of it? Yes, I do. It's can happen in Canada. You sure it lost all the engine failures and had to land on a race car crash? Seriously. All right, it lost all engines because of a fuel leak and uh, basically had to land, and it landed successfully yes. on <laughs> a empty old airport. Became a racetrack. Yeah, it's it's a it's a good story. And, if you like and, that one, and I'm pretty sure there were two children playing on the web, playing with bikes on the runway. Yes, they were, and they try to outrun, and they try to outrun an airplane that was landing, which is kind of weird. Uh, what would you run forward? You know, go sideways. You know, these these two kids were trying to bicycle ahead of a landing airplane, straight ahead. Why would you do that? Why don't you just go to the side? So much easier. That's just right. What's the safest type of airplane? What's that? What's the safest type of airplane with the least crashes? I'd say A380s. Mm, well, A380 hasn't been in service for too long and it's already out of service. So I can't really say that. But I think one of the safest ones historically has been the 777 or the 747 so far, historically. Yeah, the 747 is like the workhorse of planes. That's my favorite airplane. See this right here? This is my 747 logo. My, my, that's my first airplane that I ever worked on, and uh, that's the one that I love. It's a beautiful, beautiful airplane. I don't think there was ever a better yeah, airplane than the 747. It could be newer, it could be fancier, but there's nothing better. <laughs> that's my opinion. <laughs> my uh, my personal favorite is the 787 Dreamliner. Ooh, it's a good airplane. Yeah. It's a great awesome. airplane, but but it's still new. It has its own little things, you know, that it has to deal with. It's a very fancy airplane, I but I don't know. Well, it's new. It's yeah. new. It's, it's been still released. New. It was released, I'm pretty sure, four to five years ago. That's yeah, but that's new. that's that's baby for that. Those are babies compared to the Douglas and everything. Right. Exactly. So you know, you get you you grade the the airplane by its longevity and history. So the 787 so far, you know, it has a mixed history. It had engine failures and battery failures and a whole bunch of other things, but. Uh, you know, we have to wait till a little bit further to analyze. I'll just say, give it ten years before you analyze the the reliability of the seven eight seven. But it is a very good airplane. It is reliable. Have you ever seen the seven zero seven? It's out of commission. No. All planes are mostly out of commission. No, I'm not that old. Seven zero seven. I haven't seen. I, the only one I've seen is in a, is in a museum in Washington D.C. I've seen a seven zero seven. Pretty cool airplane. It's a question. Huh? Yeah, ask a question. I have a question. Yeah. So uh, I've seen some fighter jets, and uh, they have a designation called vertical landing, but not vertical yes. takeoff. So how is that possible? Um, most of the fighter jets that I know does have vertical landing and takeoff capability. Um, but, not all uh, I saw jets, one. Some, uh, I I saw one which has no vertical takeoff but only vertical landing. Which one is that? Do you remember? Uh, I think it's F twenty two Raptor. Okay, for those of us who don't know what vertical landing and vertical takeoff is, can you please explain it? Yeah, so vertical landing, most airplanes land like this. You know, it just goes slowly down and then lands, right? Vertical landing, it can actually come sometimes vertical, but most of the time it comes like a little bit at an angle and then lands like this. And of course, taking off, it does almost like a helicopter. It kind of takes off like that. But um, the F-22 definitely is not vertical takeoff or landing. You cannot do it. Um, Wait, uh, I don't think that's the one, but I, I saw, I, I've seen one, but I'm not sure which one was it. Uh, but well, it, I don't, it, it I, I'm not sure. Like I said, I, I, there's no way anybody could know every single thing. And uh, uh, that's one of the, air, uh, one of them that I don't know. Uh, but uh, most, 99% of the airplanes or okay, the aircraft. Okay. I, think, I, think I, I think I remember it. I think I remember it now. Uh, I yeah. think it's designation in the US Air Force was Lightning. That's F-22. Can't be. Okay. So, yeah. 
F22 okay. is, is not known for vertical anti. There was a F23, I think that was that was being trialed as a vertical takeoff line. It had an engine scoop that basically went like this and then it would turn completely downward and then it would actually do vertical landings. Uh, yeah, so maybe that is one do of my doubts. Takeoff. That's one yeah. of my doubts. Uh, how do you like, uh, you know, how do you take off vertically and land vertically with one engine on the back? Um, it has a lot to do with how the air is uh, uh, redirected. So you're using that thrust to slow you down to do the descent into the ground and using that thrust again, of course, more power to get it off the ground. But also it, needs, it has these little jets on the side that balances the airplane left and right. So it doesn't go full left or full right. So it's a, it's a balancing act. That's why a lot of the airplanes are, are just basically normal takeoff and landing because it is very difficult to do that. It uses a lot of energy, a lot of fuel to do vertical takeoff and landing. Uh, but it has its advantages, obviously, because you can operate at a smaller airport, even a helipad sometimes, and uh, work that way. So it has its advantage, but definitely has disadvantages. And a lot of them um, are not known for their speed any speed as a regular airplane. Door. Yeah. From all of these questions, I'm getting, I think they, a lot of people here have bitten the aviation bug. <laughs> okay, yeah. I have another doubt. Uh, I've seen an airplane, I think it's called Burkut. Uh, so it has backwards wings. How does it fly? Which 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 airplane? It's called Burkut. B E R C K U T. I saw it in a flight simulator app, so uh, I was not sure about it. So does oh, it I don't know. I it has do not know. Uh, it has there uh, was... wings that are backwards, so it plays like backwards wings. Yeah, I um I think the there was an experimental airplane in the U.S. Air Force slash NASA called the X twenty five I believe or is it X fifteen I don't know. I think it's X twenty five or X twenty nine I don't remember the designation but it did have canard wings so in other words basically wings that are facing the opposite way um, the trouble with that with that airplane was is it was extremely difficult to fly it was very unstable. Uh, for a normal pilot or a human to control. So it had a lot of augmentation or control input from um, computers. Yeah. So the airplane was unflyable without computers, okay? But the good thing is from that technology, fly-by-wire and a whole bunch of other technologies came that today, even in commercial aviation, we use. So yeah, it doesn't really work that well. I mean, don't base your knowledge on flight simulator like uh, games or whatnot because a lot of them are inaccurate very grossly exaggerated airplane stuff so don't rely on that too much okay yes i was just confirming because i was not sure about it myself yeah it's probably based on the x-25 the nasa bird Ooh, sir? Uh, um so for those of us who are like to become like future who want to pursue careers in the aviation field, what's yeah. your advice? What classes should we take during high school and college? Okay, so high school and college, sciences are the, the main part, right? Because uh, if you're going to be a pilot, um, a lot of uh, the things that, uh, you know, people will say, oh, you got to know science and math. But why? Why do you need to know science and math? One of the biggest sciences you have to know, believe it or not, as a pilot is weather and atmospheric conditions. Weather is one of the biggest factors of being a pilot and the knowledge base for being a pilot. You don't even have to watch the weather report if you're a pilot because you already know how to predict the weather looking at the numbers that are coming towards you. So weather is one of those things that, that nobody ever thinks about as being a pilot, but it's a very big uh, uh, part of it. As far as, uh, uh, give, me, give me a second, let me answer that question first and I'll come back to you. And uh, the, uh, the sciences, the maths and everything else, if you go into aeronautical engineering, I mean, there's no way around it. Calculus and all these other uh, things will come into play. Physics, aerodynamics obviously plays a role, right? Sciences are heavy on aviation, um, especially the manufacturing, production, research section of it. It's, it's immense. Uh, even when you're flying an airplane, you got to do calculations with your head or maybe figure out things very quickly in your head. So science and mathematics go, go right in hand with it. Okay. Does that make sense, Shrikar? Yeah. Okay. Back. Uh, who was it that wanted to add a question? Okay. Is it true that the smallest of like accidents can cause like catastrophic results? Smallest of miscalculation. Um, yes and no. No like practice ever. 
no crash is ever a result of one one thing. It's usually a chain of events that yes, happen. There, a crash. Was, there was one. It was like, it's quite old. That's why some of you may not remember it. Which one? I'm pretty sure it was a Swiss Airlines flight one 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 crash from the Atlantic Ocean. Yeah. The the fire. Yeah, I know. I know about it. <laughs> I it know about a, all the it, crashes. And uh, the the crash happened due to a uh, due to something wrong in the. In the in the business class movie entertainment system. Wow! Look at you. How old are you? Ten. You're ten, and you've been watching a lot of uh, air disasters, huh? Since he was so... three, he knew everything about <laughs> airplanes and boats. Well, it's good. It's it's very good. You know that that kind of ties into what Shrika was saying. Um, since you were three, that's very good. When you when you get into the aviation field, or if you want to be a pilot, the younger you start, the way better it is. The younger you start in this field, the more knowledge you can build, the more experience you can build. Because uh, unfortunately or fortunately, everything is seniority based at the job. So in other words, the earlier you join the job, the better selection of vacation you have, the better selection of airplanes you have, the better selection of schedule you have. So the younger, the better. So if you want to get started in the field of aviation, um, like myself, well, this uniform that I'm wearing right now is from my other job where I don't fix airplanes, but I teach people how to get the license to fix airplanes. And uh, over there, most of the kids graduate from that high school with uh, when they're 18 years old, where I graduated from, and they go out from 18, 19 years old and work in the real world and work on commercial airplanes. And they get the experience at a very young age versus people that go to college and have to get the hours over there. And then by the time they start working on airplanes, they'll be like 25, maybe 24. So the earlier you get out there, the better. I know uh, one of my uh, what students the became age? early as what? Age? Four. Early age for what? Um, for the course. Well, I'll give you the pilot side of it. The earliest age you can get a license over here in the United States is 17 years old for the private pilot license. So you can start flying at the age of 16, get the license by like 17, or even you can actually start flying earlier than that, but uh, you have to be 17 to get the license here in the United States. And then once you do that, you can become a commercial airline pilot by the time you're 21. So that's the early. Uh, yeah, I have a question. I have a question. Is it actually true that people with glasses are not allowed to be pilots or? What am I wearing? Yeah, you're wearing glasses. I fly. I mean, like being the pilot. Wait, okay. Never mind. The... Yeah, yeah, you could. Um, what you could do is, um, um, even in the Air Force, they, there's exceptions for that, okay? Um, some, maybe like a, maybe a, a certain countries do not allow people with the glasses to fly. Uh, because they have so many people that don't have glasses that are just as qualified. So why would they want to take a risk on you? You know, they'll say that. But because there was a pilot shortage, they lowered all those requirements and uh, they allow people to fly with glasses. It's not a problem, especially commercial aviation. Definitely not a problem. Oh, okay. The yeah. only thing that might prevent you is the uh, color vision. If you have color vision issue, if you're completely color deficient, then uh, night flying would not be permitted by you. Other than that, you can still fly during the day. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have a doubt. Uh, I wanted I wanted you to talk on uh, like turbulence as a general topic. Can you do that? Turbulence, for the most part, is like bumps on the road. When you go down the road when you're driving, don't you feel bumps? Yeah, yeah. So that's going to happen on an airplane. So yes. it's just air being this way and that way. Sometimes the bumps are severe. Sometimes it might cause you know issues. But as far as an airplane is concerned, yes, the airplane might, uh, you know, the people inside the airplane might come off the seat and maybe hit the ceiling in severe, severe, severe turbulence. But that's what they tell you. Always wear your seatbelt. Seat belt. People don't do it. But whenever I'm on an airplane flying 15 hours to India, that seatbelt is always on because I know better. Anybody who's in the aviation field knows better. And the people that don't know are the ones who are not in the aviation field. And they think, oh, we're in the airplane. I'm going to relax. I'm going to watch a movie for the next 14 hours, not with a seatbelt on. And then so all of a sudden, you know, turbulence comes and they'll come off the seat. They're like, oh, my God, what happened? Uh, and I look at them and I say, I told you. So keep the seatbelt on. That's it. Uh, and the airplanes can handle the turbulence. Even the most severe turbulence, the airplane can handle it. And remember, the pilots have the vision to see with weather radar what's in front of them as far as weather is concerned. And most of the severe turbulence, what do you do if you're flying towards turbulence? 
You don't. You turn. You go around it. Okay? You fly around it. Okay, so can so, you explain the types of turbulence that can be caused? Um, the most uh, turbulent or the most uh, uh, dangerous one is a uh, wind shear or like a, a downdraft where an airplane is coming down for a, a landing and there's a big like wind coming in and hitting the airplane from the top. So you could lose uh, um, altitude really, really quickly. That's so, about the most dangerous one, wind shear. Okay, so is it's called, uh, a, it's called a microburst actually. Yeah, what that's... happens? The microburst is like it, it comes down straight down like this, and it splits like all directions. So mm -hmm. it's kind of dangerous because if you hit the microburst head on, you have wind pushing you initially, and then down in the middle, and then trying to push you out at the end of it. So it's like various uh, uh, degrees so of. That's similar to a cloud cloud burst, right? Are those same? Yeah, base, basically the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, same thing. So uh, that's I about the old, dang, most dangerous thing. Yeah, yeah, I had an doubt. So what if a helicopter is started near the runway of uh, where the airplane is taking off? Yeah. So what would happen? Like, what kind of turbulence would be caused, and what would be the effects of it? Hopefully, nothing, because if you have uh, turbulence ahead of you, the air traffic control knows what kind of airplane is taken off before you, and they will warn you you have this happening, or they will space out the landing so that. You do not get caught up in that because uh, wake turbulence. That's what that's what that's when you're talking yeah. about. It's called wake turbulence. I was about um, to ask about that. Yeah, it, it can be avoid. It can be avoided. That's that's the simplest answer, and you should avoid it, right? Yeah. So you uh, fly behind or below a big airplane, and uh, you avoid it. That's all. It's it's a simple so, thing to avoid. It's okay. Not, so uh, if if by any chance you're not able to avoid it, what can be the effects? Ah, uh, the airplane will be tossed around. Right. Okay. It'll be so, tossed around, but the airplane will still fly. Once the turbulence is gone, it'll fly through it and should be fine. There are extreme cir circumstances where you know more things happen, but that is so so rare. I mean, it's like hitting the lottery like twice. It's not. It's so rare. So, uh, is there any kind of turbulence which instantly uh, forces the airplane to go into a nosedive? Microburst. That's it. Like it, it forces the airplane to go to a nosedive. Yeah, either a microburst or a or um or a wind shear. But even then, airplane flying like this would not go like this, right? Okay. It doesn't happen. It, the turbulence happens like this, like it just like bumps around. It's like it's like a it's if it, it, this is fl uh, free flowing air, turbulence is like free flowing and then has a dip and then comes back up. So airplane goes dip and comes back up. Yeah. So nothing will ever force the airplane to go boom, like this. It just doesn't happen. Okay. It, it's more like, you know, it'll push down like this. Maybe it'll push it up or push it sideways, but almost never will put you in a nose down configuration. It's, 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 it's a possible. Yeah. But it's not, it's not probable. Yeah. Okay. okay. There's a big difference between possible and probable. That's why it's so safe. Uh, my last question is, yeah. um, so how is the airline industry coping with the COVID-19 pandemic and how is it changing? How is it making okay, sure. airlines? Okay, so a lot of people are afraid to fly the airplane, right? And a lot of people believe the airplane should fly half empty. I disagree with both of them because I work in the field and I know what's going on. Now, as far as COVID is concerned, obviously everybody's scared to fly and sit next to each other. I understand that. But remember one thing, the airplane has um, a air management system, let's call it, okay? Where it basically gets air from the outside and the air that you're breathing is basically fresh air, sort of, okay? It's new air, let's put it that way. It's not fresh air, but it's a new air. So every 20 seconds or so, the airplane basically gets new air and it has big heavy duty HEPA filters that block out and filter out all the contaminants that are running in the air. So if you think about it, Sitting in an airplane is safer than sitting in a car because the air, your car does not do that. You understand? Your train doesn't do that. So the airplane is way more safer handling all these contaminants in the air than any other transportation device there is. So it is very, very safe. Now, a lot of people are saying that, hey, listen, I don't want a person sitting next to me. Okay. But then there's another person sitting the seat next to you, right? How far is that person? Two feet away? 
and the minimum requirement for the COVID is six feet away. So even if you put somebody two feet away, you skip the seat in the middle, what are you doing? Nothing really, it doesn't do anything. So the, the whole idea of skipping that seat, it's more of like a appeasing, appeasing your mental, think that, oh, so you're doing something about it, but it really isn't doing anything. So leaving the seat empty next to you really doesn't do anything. What you can do and what companies like Emirates and uh, Etihad and uh, Delta, American, what they do is they recommend you cannot fly without a mask because the, most of the ways you get all that stuff to come in was through the uh, respiratory, right? Your nose and mouth. So if you cover your mouth, you cover your nose and the person sitting next to you does the same, then that is a lot better. Uh, plus you wash your hands or you use disinfectant and then you don't touch your face. You limit your contact with the, with the virus and you shouldn't have it. So I don't think there is a, much of an issue of flying these days, except you know, a lot of the countries have uh, restrictions on entry, restrictions on uh, lockdown once you come in, quarantine once you come in. But it really isn't as uh, scary as a lot of people make it seem like it is. I think it's a lot safer than what people see, what they think it is. It is way safer than anything else, any, any other mode of transport, including your own car. If you have some stranger sitting in your car, that's way more dangerous than sitting next to a stranger on an airplane. There's no doubt about it. But you know, it's it's going to be a, it's going to be a different scenario. It's going to be a whole different aviation world. A lot of people in the U.S. are getting laid off. In let me see, this is August, uh, September, October. Yeah, people are going to get, start to get laid off because the business is not there because fear basically took over, and people don't want to fly anymore. Now, am I saying go out there and get on a flight and go? No, there's still a risk, obviously, being in public, you being in close proximity. But the but the reasoning behind skipping a seat and saying that the airplane is not safe, that's just not true. There's, you know, that's misleading. Yeah. Does that make sense, everyone? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Vimal, for this wonderful interview. Sure. Uh, I would also like to thank our participants and hope that they've learned something new from this session today. At the Early Burst Teens Club, we are focused on waking up early and changing our lifestyle so that we can be more connected to nature and to ourselves. We host multiple events that are streamed live to you via Facebook Live. You can explore our website, earlybirdsclub.org, or hop onto our Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter page, at Early Birds Teens. If you have any questions, please shoot an email to teens at earlybirdsclub.org. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone.